So obviously we were gonna see each other in a month or whatever for rocking the bowl. Uh, unfortunately, that's all gone downhill. Um, but what do you think to the music scene at the minute? Kind of despite that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bands that were on at rocking the bowl that we've obviously seen at quite a few festivals over the last maybe year or so. Um, and so yeah, there's some great acts, man. Like a lot of guys that I've sort of been on the same bill as um you know that I, I i really rate some great players and the, the biggest thing for me is songwriting really and mm. you know bands that have good tunes and so um yeah there's tons of great stuff um i like quite a variety of different music as well so it's like um you know from blues music through to sort of heavy rock and then even acoustic folk stuff as well so yeah there's there's um, we're sort of like overloaded with music at the moment mm. um which is cool, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and obviously you've got the, the EP box set thing coming out um, next month. How did that idea come about? Well, I released an album early on this year called The Hammer Falls. And um, during the process of doing The Hammer Falls, I was offered um, the opportunity to work with Kevin Shirley, who, um, you know, is has produced some incredible artists. I made in Led Zeppelin, Joe Bonamassa, just loads of different people. Um, so I was kind of in the, the last stages of mixing the last record with uh, Josiah Manning, who mm. um, is based down at Momentum Studios and is part of Chris Barris band. Uh, and so Kevin offered to do, I think it was originally maybe one song or two songs. Um, and so I had this idea of doing a kind of like remix of some of the tracks we were working on last year. Mm. And so what you hear on this EP is, um, you know, alternate takes actually of some of the songs. And so Kevin got sent a lot of the, you know, the, the different versions of the tracks. So yeah. I think it's, it's quite interesting really to compare it to the other versions that are on the album. And then there's a brand new song on the EP as well. So um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know. mm. um, and obviously it's, it's not something you kind of see, nowadays within the kind of underground scene do you think it's kind of i've seen a lot of different merch and that kind of thing at the minute with the smaller bands do you think it's that kind of yeah it's going that way to kind of push for more merch sales in an essence you know to try and actually make a living out of it or yeah i guess i've always wanted to try and come up with new ideas in terms of uh the product that i put out there um you know when i it's interesting because when I put my album Who Feeds the Wolf out, which is actually almost three years ago now, mm. I did it on this sort of splattered red and black vinyl, mm. which seemed quite a unique thing at the time, but everybody's doing it now. So, yeah. I, you know, I'm not insinuating they're doing it because I did it, but I think it's... Um, I I could have done this release as another vinyl release, um, mm. you know, with a multicolored vinyl. But there were two reasons why I didn't. One was that I wanted to try something different. Um, and I, I wanted to do something that was a, a sort of two disc set that was a little bit like the Rolling Stones from the Vault series, where they have a CD and a DVD as mm, part of the set. Yeah. And also I bought this um, Winery Dogs DVD a couple of years back that was pretty cool. And that was, um, you know, this, it was like an, a, a, almost like a companion disc for the record. So mm. you got this sort of extra four tracks and then you know dvd with some of the music videos so that's where the idea come from it mm. uh, came from for it and so i just didn't want to do it on vinyl uh as well because of the experience of the, the vinyl manufacturing over the last two years it's taken mm. so long to do it um yeah i've know, heard a few bands that are yeah really struggling now it's pushed back to like nine months or something ridiculous for a, a wait yeah. time for it I mean, I was lucky with the Hammer Falls in that I, I sort of got a bit of a heads up about what was coming. So I, I did my, I put my order in for that before the album was even fully recorded. So I paid right. for the vinyl slot. Mm. Um, I think it was a plant over in the Czech Republic that did it. Okay. Um, 
but yeah, I paid for the slot like 10 months prior God, and yeah. I'd not even finished the, the fucking album. So there was a bit of a risk there. Mm. I mean, we'd finished the bulk of it. There was only three songs, I think, that we still had to record. But yeah, okay. there was, you know, it, it could have gone completely horribly wrong that. But fortunately, I got my slot and we produced a, a batch of vinyl. But but with this release, I, I wanted to get something out really for the latter half of this year. Um and the Kevin Shirley ke- ke- uh, thing came about, and I thought it was an exciting thing to do. Something just a little bit different, you know? Yeah. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, you've got kind of a, a tour book for the end of the year. Is it just looking like it's touring for the foreseeable? Are you writing again? Or Yeah, so um, I'm heading out. Mm. I'm actually supposed to be going to Spain uh next month which should be quite good fun that'll be the first time really that i've gone over to europe since the pandemic all kicked Mm. off um so at the moment i'm just trying to work all the stuff out in terms of car notes and you know visa stuff i think the visa stuff is all right but there's a lot of information that i'm trying to work out and um you know when i started playing guitar when i was like 14 I didn't envisage that it would all be just admin at one stage in my career. I mean, that's kind of what it, what I'm doing this week. I'm, today, I've been uh, like removing shelving from my van to convert it into a tour van. So I've turned into like Mr. DIY today. But um, mm. yeah, so next month we're heading out on tour. I've got a new band that are coming out with me later on in the year, which is cool. Um, so I've got this brilliant bass player called uh, Charlie Rachel Kay, who's joining and mm. she's... She's the bass player for Ashley Sherlock, so um, oh, that's yeah. gonna be really cool. Cool to have a different bass player, and then the drummer is Phil Wilson, who um, he's played with tons of people: Els Bailey, uh, Sean Webster, mm. Lawrence Jones. So it, it, it's going to be exciting to take a different band out, and mm. you know, um, I've had the same band for almost four years now with um, two guys called Laz and Filippo, who. You know, we've worked really well together, had some amazing experiences, but they're they're kind of moving on to do different projects and mm. stuff. So um yeah, it's exciting to play some new songs. And as you say, I, I've been writing a lot of material recently. So we'll see if that makes it into the set. I hope it will. Mm. Um so yeah, but it, it'll be a real shift in terms of the last tour where we were kind of doing stuff that we've been playing for maybe two or three years. Exactly. Think, yeah. Now's the time to um Refresh it a bit. I've got a brand new hat to wear on the tour as well, so I need to play some new songs to to go with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and do you think it'll have a bit of a different feel on stage then with these new people? I imagine it'll be a lot of rehearsal beforehand to kind of get a... Yeah, I don't know, man. Thing. I I think you can... I've never been, been one to sort of over-rehearse ahead of tours. I think you've got to allow things to kind of organically, um, you know, develop. And so... You know, you've got to trust players actually as well. You know, you, mm. I'm not getting in a bunch of shit players to play with me. These these are people that are going to really smash it. So, the person who really needs to do the homework tends to be me because uh, I am a bit of a scatterbrain with all of this stuff. And actually, I I kind of move on from project to project quite quickly. So, mm. um, I need to be reminded by my manager that you know we we should actually be playing songs from the current album. That's something. <laughs> yeah, um, not just all new ones. But yeah, we, we're kind of um, we're looking at getting some rehearsals in later this month, uh, which is exciting in itself. It's just good to kind of hook up. I always think with with bands, you've got to you've got to kind of foster a vibe with the people that are part of the band. Mm. Music is one element of it, but if people are miserable in the band, they're not going to play very well. So yeah. part of what I, I always do with any band that I take out of me is I want them to, to just enjoy it. This is like, this is rock and roll, man. They should be going out and having a fucking blast on tour, not sort of moping and moaning about it. So hopefully, uh, you know, Phil and Charlie will have a really good time when they come out with me later in the year. Mm. So it'd be good. Awesome. Um, and it's looking like you've got some good support bands as well, actually. Um, what would you kind of say the... Uh, obviously the new wave of classic rock scene is quite big these days and they all seem to kind of be a part of that alongside you. Would you say it's a good environment? I know from what I've seen, it's everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of speak quite closely with my manager, uh, where's about who to take out, you know, it, it, I, I always see support slots. although I don't really like using the word support. <laughs> There's an opportunity for, you know, these the bands that come out with me to kind of meet my audience and it mm. gives them an opportunity to kind of gain fans, I suppose. 
But also, like, I just want some bands that are going to come out and make it a pleasurable experience for me as well. Yeah, so exactly. I, I make sure I listen to the acts and I think, you know, I want a, a, a badass collection of bands that are co- going to come out. And it means that before I go on stage, I can go out front and watch the bands and have a good time myself. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, we've got a band that are coming out on a few dates, uh, Firekind, who are doing St. Hostel Band Club. Uh, they're doing the Bristol Thunderbolt show, and they they was the, the support acts on my tour last year, and oh, they were course, just great, yeah. great to have around, and uh, just funny fuckers, you know. They make you laugh, and that's what you want. And uh, obviously, White Raven Down are a fucking incredible band, so yeah. um, I'm really looking forward to having them out as well. So we're still working on a few of the um, few of the support acts. I was I was just trying to resolve something regarding the Blackpool show. We've got some exciting news regarding that coming out. Oh, cool. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's part of the fun of it. I like playing my show, but I also want to enjoy the evening. You know, yeah, I like exactly. going and watch live music. So I want bands that come out with me to be the sort of stuff that I would want to go and see, you know? Mm. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and to kind of follow on from that, I guess, um, do you have any advice for a new musician wanting to get into this kind of business, you know, whether it's through a band or, you know, kind of more session playing or solo stuff? Yeah, I think I think it's quite easy now to be given so much advice from different people that a lot of musicians really don't know what direction to take with their careers. And I think sometimes it's easy to kind of lose a little bit of sort of integrity in yourself chasing something that is this kind of imaginary version of success that, um, you know, the biggest thing that a lot of bands that talk to me, particularly super young bands, they they want to get a record deal. And that is the kind of aim of what they're yeah. doing. And, you know, I know a lot of people that have been through, you know, uh, various record deals and things that can be incredibly positive experiences, but they can similarly be awful experiences. Yeah. So you shouldn't necessarily tie yourself to this one specific thing. The biggest thing for me is like, do you enjoy the music that you're playing? Because I've been in bands prior to me doing my solo career, which I've sort of been doing for about seven years now. Um, I was in bands that I fucking hated. And so I was playing music and going out and being miserable and losing, you know, losing the the idea of what I wanted to be as a musician from when I was a kid. You know, yeah. when I was a teenager, I just wanted to really be Jimmy Page. Now, that's obviously never going to happen, but it's easy to sort of chase money and chase the dreams of a record deal, and then you get lost in this sort of horrible environment where people are just fucking telling you what to do all the time. Yeah. And you're not making the music that you feel passionate about. I'm very fortunate in that I, I'm the artist, so I can make the music I want to want to make. I've exactly, operated yeah. as, as an independent artist and a DIY musician for seven years so there's nobody really standing over me going that isn't going to get played on the radio so don't record it mm. um i couldn't give a fuck about that to be honest it's like some of my stuff gets played on the radio some of it i'm sure radio djs whatever they'll listen to it and go i fucking hate that <laughs> but i couldn't care less it's whether yeah. i believe that it's a good song and i think exactly, that's yeah. the best thing that musicians should do really mm. yeah that's definitely good advice yeah you know, why is my eight-minute guitar-based uh, track with 17 guitar solos not getting played on the radio? I don't know. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I, I mean, I'd love that, personally, but... <laughs> you wouldn't, mate. It sounds shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, 